prayer book. This is the book of names. It's not prayer request. It is people who put their names in here. As we said before, the Lord knows what you need. He knows how to lift you up, and he knows how to supply all things that you need. Um, if you put your name in this book, let me find it. Pastor Woody will send you a Rock and Country Church is praying for me, and we pray for each individual. If you're here at the church, ask him. He will get you one. If you're online, there is an address. Uh, if not on the screen now, uh, there's addresses on our website where you can send it, and he will send you this decal. Um, if everybody will remove their hats, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we come to you again, and we just thank you for allowing us to come before you and and ask these things, Lord. We pray that you'll lay your hands upon each and every person in this book, that you will touch their lives and lift them up and fulfill whatever needs they may have. We ask that you'll touch all the churches in the community, Lord. Those who preach your word, we pray that you will just continue to lift them up. If they don't preach your word, Lord, we just ask that you will touch the pastor of that church and show him the truth and show him what your word truly means. We ask that you'll be with the people of this community, Lord, that you will lift them up and that you will lead them to a church, uh, wherever it may be, Lord, where you them to be we ask that you will lift up pastor woody that you will allow him to deliver the message that you have given him, him lord and we just thank you so much for all the wonderful wonderful things that you abound to us we ask that you'll uh, lift up our tithes and offerings lord and allow us to use them for what you deem to be, them to be used for in jesus name we ask these things amen man amen hey man well good morning rocks and country church it is so glad to see our prayer warriors back ted and beverly if you if you need prayer for something and you need a prayer warrior to come alongside you there's your folks right there raise your hand ted and beverly 69 years of marriage they just celebrated as well Woo amen amen we love those two right there of course we love everybody but uh, as god loves them but those two right there are very very special to us and uh, i'm just going to share this uh, they both had some medical issues here lately and so they haven't been here in quite a while but uh, i mean there's some as beverly told me just a while ago she says you don't know how much we have prayed for y'all while we've been gone they never stop praying I, I, I think they need knee pads because their knees are so wore out. They pray so much. But, but they're just awesome, awesome people, and we dearly, dearly love them, and we're glad they're here today. And we hope that they will stay healthy and stay with us. You want your water, brother? All right. No, no, it's good. It's good. Um, lo and behold, uh, if you're new friends visiting with us, you will notice that we pray a lot here, Okay. Prayer is very, very important. And matter of fact, my message today uh, and for the next couple of weeks is going to be on prayer, on the true Lord's Prayer. And we're going to talk about that uh, here in just a minute. You know, you don't have to be in church to pray. You don't have to be at the dinner table to pray. You don't have to get on your knees to pray, though you can. You don't have to raise your hands to pray, though you can. Prayer is simply talking to God. Now, a lot of times people say, well, God knows my heart, so I can just, you know, just think it, right? Well, God knows your heart, and you can just think it. However, however, if you read through scriptures, scripture tells us to use our words because our words have power. Just like God's words have power, and he spoke everything to into existence your word has power why because you have the holy spirit living inside of you and the holy spirit speaks on your behalf so we need to speak those words out when we pray and if you remember over in scripture there was a, a blind guy blind beggar sitting alongside the road one day and blind his name was blind bartimaeus as they referred to him as and he was laying on the side of the road begging for alms and you know whatever people would give him and he heard he heard not saw he heard that jesus was passing by and he jumped up and he said jesus 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 and jesus stopped in his tracks he stopped him why because blind bartimaeus called out to him he called out to him he used his voice he couldn't use his eyes he used his voice and he called out to jesus and jesus stopped in his tracks and turned and said what do you want that's what jesus does when you speak out your prayers it stops god in his tracks 
And he turns to you and he says, what do you need? What do you want? What can I do for you? So that's why we pray. And that's why we pray aloud. Now you can do a silent prayer if you want to. But it's far more effective if we have a congregation united in praying to God and speaking to God. Because it stops God in his tracks. And he says, he, he doesn't limit it to us now. But he says, Rocket Country Church, what do you need? What do you want? What can I do for you? How can I show my love? How can I pour out my blessings on you? That's why we pray. That's why we pray. And it gets God's attention and he stops in his tracks. And he says, tell me. Talk to me. That's why we pray. And you can do that at any time. Prayer is very, very important. It should be a part of your everyday existence. Not your everyday life. Your everyday existence. You should be praying about something, anything, everything. Paul even tells us, he says, pray continuously. Now, he's not talking about just do nothing but pray. Okay? You got to sleep, you got to eat, you got to work, etc. But you can pray while you sleep and while you work and while you eat. Okay? So that's what he means by praying continuously. So God put this on my heart this morning. I, I kind of thought I was going to teach on this, and I love teaching on this. This is the true Lord's Prayer. Uh, if you want to go ahead and open your Bibles, it'll be chapter 17 of the Gospel of John. Chapter 17 of the Gospel of John. We're going to get to it in just a second. Why? Because we're going to pray. That's why. We pray. This is a praying church. And we, if you'll see at the end, we pray for people whenever they're sick and they're ill, they come forward. It's not that we have any power. There's power only used through us by God himself. He's the healer, not us. And so we will pray for people at the end. We will have our uh, corporate prayer today at the end of the... And so we just come together and we just pray. Why? Because it stops God in his tracks. And he lends us his ear and he listens to us. Now, a lot of people say, well, if he knows my heart, then he knows what I need to pray for, right? He wants to hear you to speak. He wants you to, he gave you a voice. He wants you to use that voice. There's power in your words. But if you don't use your words, the power cannot be activated. So you want to be blessed? You want God to stop in his tracks? Pray. But pray aloud. Pray aloud. Don't keep it to yourself. Oh, well, I can't pray in front of people. Uh, uh, uh. What do you think about that, Margo? Huh? Yes, sister, you sure can pray in front of people, can't you? And the reason I say that, got to point her out. I love her. She's awesome. But a long time, not a long time ago, a short while back, a couple of years maybe, she says, well, I can never pray in front of people. Well, when Chris preaches, she's going to pray. Okay? She prays for him. Yeah, she can do it. And if she can do it, I guarantee you, you can do it. We can all do it. The problem is we don't do it, okay? So let's correct that and let's pray. Let's pray. Let's talk to God, amen? He will give us his ear. So let's pray. Guys, if you'll remove your hats. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word, Lord, which is Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us your word and you will continually reveal to us the meanings and the depths and the, and the message of your word because there's power in your word. Father, we thank you so much for your word, which is Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. I ask you, Lord, to use us today as your vessels in order to bring forth that word, which is Jesus Christ. Let it touch the hearts, minds, souls, and spirits of all those who hear it today. May it resonate and grow and manifest itself so the fruit shall be born by all who hear your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to dismiss the kiddos. And then we'll get started. Now, many of you probably in the last few weeks have kind of uh, come accustomed to... Uh, uh, what we've been talking about in different scriptures to where it is, uh, you know, we just take a couple of verses and we talk about them, right? And so maybe many, maybe many of you are used to that, and maybe many of you think that's what we're going to do today. Eh -eh. We're going to go back to the old way of doing things, let's say. And so we're going to be searching through the scriptures, 
looking up scripture. If you can't, if, if I go too fast, please ask me to slow down, and I will slow down. But we need to look, and we're going to talk about a grand total of five verses today out of chapter 17. I thought I was going to teach on the whole thing, but as it comes, uh, I'm going to only teach on five verses. But in that five verses, we're going to look at several other verses. Man, half of our church just went out of here. Amen. Amen. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Look at it. Where did everybody go? That's good. That's good. All right. So uh, we're going to uh, be in chapter 17 to start with. And I want to teach on this. Uh, things we need to understand right off the bat is that uh, chapter 17 is the Lord Jesus Christ praying. It is his prayer. Okay, it's not our prayer. This is Jesus' prayer to the Father. And this is the true Lord's prayer. Now, over in Matthew 6 and Luke 11, you will see what Jesus is teaching his disciples and showing his disciples. This is, in, understand this, this is how you should pray. It is a pattern it is, it is a way to pray. It's how to formulate your prayer, if you will, in order to reach the ears of God. So it's a way to, to teach us how to format our prayers to get God's attention. But as I said just a minute ago, when you pray, just as blind Bartimaeus did, when you pray, you get God's ear. God hears you. Yes, he knows your heart. He hears every prayer you say, every prayer. But if you really want to get God's ear, if you will, then pray aloud. Don't keep it to yourself. Man, share it to the world. The Lord's Prayer, as we know it over in Matthew 6 and Luke 11, where it says, Our Father who art in heaven, etc., all right, that is the pattern as to how we should pray. And if you want to call that the Lord's Prayer, that's fine. That's what we know it as. But it's not the true Lord's, Jesus' prayer. Chapter 17 is the Lord Jesus' prayer. <clears throat> we are a praying church, and each member's prayers are very important to the unity and the connection that we have with God. It's very important to pray. I can't emphasize enough how important it is to talk with God because that's what prayer is. Prayer is just talking with God, okay? It doesn't have to be, you know, real formal. It doesn't, and I'm not making fun. Oh, Heavenly Father, how be it thy name? Thou, thou bringeth unto me thy word, okay? That's not how we talk. Okay, and I'm not trying to make fun of people who talk like that, if anybody does. What is very simple to understand and what we need to understand is God wants to know you. He wants it from you. He wants it from your heart. He wants to hear, you know how I talk to my wife? Well, I better not talk to God that way. No, 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 no. I, she doesn't need to talk to me to God that way. No, no, no. What, I, what I'm insinuating is, is that God wants to hear you talk just like you would talk to me, just like you would talk to anybody else. God wants to hear your heart in your words. Don't put on a show for God. It does not impress God if you are trying to be someone you're not. But if you present who you truly are from your heart, man, you'll stop God in his tracks. You'll stop him in his tracks. And there will be nothing else around but you. But you. Man, and whenever I pray, I want to hear, I want God to hear me. I want him to know exactly that it is me talking to him. I don't want him to think that it's Johnny talking to him, but boy, that'd be messed up. No, I wouldn't. He hears Johnny just as much as he hears me. But he wants to hear from Johnny the way Johnny prays. He wants to hear from Woody the way Woody prays. He wants to hear from you the way you pray. Don't put on a show for God, okay? Don't put on a show for God. He's not impressed, all right? Not impressed at all. 
Each of us, separately and collectively, should have a unified prayer life. Believing in faith, believing in faith, that means trust, trusting God. Believing in faith of the words and the works of Christ. Of the words and the works of Christ. So in other words, in order to believe by faith, we must know the words and the works of Christ, do we not? Sure we do. Not just praying for ourselves, but also praying for the world to the one true God. To the one true God. Chapter 17 comes to us at the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. Chapter 13 through chapter 17 of the Gospel of John are the few hours, the few moments, the very short time that Jesus spent with his disciples the night before he is to be crucified the next day. The night before he is, is to be arrested before the rooster crows. So he is spending this time, chapter 13 through chapter 17, which I dearly love. Uh, the book of John is my favorite book, without a doubt. But chapter 13 through chapter 17 is Jesus taking his 11 disciples because Judas is excused, if you will, at the first of it. He takes his 11 disciples and he says, look, I'm going to share with you what is or what was, what is and what is to come. What was, what is and what is to come so that you may take my message out into the world. Those 11. See, Jesus did not come to teach the world. He came to teach those 11, actually 12. But he came to teach his disciples, his apostles, those he appointed to carry his message and to further his ministry. He, he, he has them, a captive audience, if you will, to share with them what was, what is, and what is to come. And he spends time with them, giving them comfort. He is fixing to go and die. He is fixing to suffer the, the worst suffering that man could actually impose on another human being. And yet he is comforting his disciples. What an awesome God we have. What a loving God we have. His prayer has three parts. If you look, I don't know if you have a heading in yours or not, but his prayer has three parts. Jesus prays for himself, one through five. Jesus prays for his disciples, one through... I don't... Uh, six, 19, one through 19. Six through 19, I'm sorry. Six through 19, Jesus prays for his disciples. And then 20 through 26, maybe there's a 27... Yeah, 26. 20 through 26, Jesus prays for who? Us. Us. Jesus prays for us 2,000 years ago? Sure he did. Why? Because he's still present today. He's still alive today. He still loves us today. He knew who was going to come and be a follower of his. He knew who was going to become a disciple of his. So he prayed for you and me. And guess what? He has prayed for your kids and your grandkids and your grandkids' grandkids are all those who will come to believe. Jesus didn't leave anybody out. He didn't leave anyone out. Today we will look at Jesus' prayer for himself, one through five. And if we can pray, and if he can pray for himself, we can also pray for ourselves. We have a lot of people from, or I have a lot of people from time to time, they'll say, well, you know, I don't feel comfortable praying for myself. <laughs> Why not? You should. Don't you want to be blessed? Well, then I think you ought to talk to God about your situation and about your issues and where you're at in your life. And we should. Jesus prayed for himself, so why can't we pray for ourselves? Well, we can. And we certainly should do that. So let's look at his prayer and see if his prayers, if our prayers that we pray today, if they follow his pattern, okay? 
And so we're going to look at 1 through 5. So in starting in verse 1, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. The hour has come. Now, if you read over in John 2 and 4, don't go there. But if you read over in John 2 and 4, when Jesus performed his first miracle, when he turned the water into wine, his mother said, Hey, buddy, and this paraphrased, of course, this is woodyology. This is not scriptural, okay, but just bear with me. Hey, son, go over there and change that water into wine because we're out of wine. And Jesus said, woman, in a very loving manner, let's say, he said, woman, why are your concerns? Why do I need to worry about your concerns? Don't you know my time has not come? In other words, my hour is not here. This is not my hour to be glorified. Yeah, I can turn the water into wine. All I got to say is, boom, done. I can heal the sick. I just say, boom, they're healed. I can do all those signs, wonders, and miracles. But my time has not come because those signs, wonders, and miracles are not his glorification. His glorification. His glorification is to be obedient. Is to be obedient. You see, the first sin that we had in the Garden of Eden was disobedience. And so his glorification was obedience, obedience to death on the cross. It was planned for him to come and sacrifice his life for you and me, to die on the cross, to suffer the worst suffering man could put upon man to take that upon himself, to take your sin and become your sin and my sin on the cross and die. But better yet, to die, to be buried, to resurrect, and to ascend to the Father. See, that's the plan. And because he lives, we too shall live. Obedience to the cross was his glorification of dying, being buried, resurrecting, and ascending back to the Father. We're going to see that in verse 5. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son also may glorify you. Glorify how? How is he going to glorify God? He's going to glorify God with his obedience. How are we to glorify God? With our obedience. One thing that you are called to do is to talk to God, to pray. To pray, which is to talk to God. Let God know your heart. Confess your sins, repent from them, but pray and talk to God. That is a part of our obedience. Jesus came to die. He came for, the, for that very, very reason. Let's go to Philippians 2. Philippians 2. And you might want to highlight this or underline this. Philippians 2, verse 8. Philippians 2, verse 8. When I hear the pages stop, I'll know you're there. And I want to thank you for bringing your Bibles. Believe me, we teach the Word of God here, as Chris said earlier, in, in everything that we do, because that's what God has called us to do. You know, God has not called me to, to tell you how bad you are, because you already know that. But in order to find out how good God is, we must open our Bible and read his word. We must read his word and study his word and receive his word. Philippians 2 verse 8, it says, In being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the death. Obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. 
of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth. And those under the earth. That means nobody's going to be left out. Everybody is going to be called to the throne of Christ at some point in time. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Even the persons who have died as unbelievers who rest in what we know as Sheol or Hell or Hades. Those people will be called to stand before Christ as well. It's called the Great White Throne Judgment. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Remember where it said over here? Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. And there it is right there. Philippians 2 and 11. All the way to the death on the cross to glorify God. God calls each of us. Do you know you're called by God? You would not be here unless you're called by God. All right? You're called by God through Jesus Christ by the power of the Spirit into that inner circle of love of God. To that inner circle of love of God. See, there's not a whole lot of people that can just get in there. You remember when Jesus says, some of my sheep try to get in or some of the... Uh, 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 not bandits. That's the only thing I can think of. Uh, some people try to get into the, the sheepfold in, in another way other than the only way, which is through Jesus Christ. Some people try to weasel their way in there. Some people think that they're in there. And some people think that, oh, well, God's got to take me because I'm such a great, great person. Jesus says, the sheep know my name and they follow me. So only by being called by God, are you a follower of Christ? You can't just do it because, oh, you know what? I think I'll just be a Christian today. I don't know if I'll be one tomorrow, but today I think I will be. It doesn't work that way. You either are or you're not. Jesus says they're either for us or they're against us. Let's go to John 6, Gospel of John 6. I'm going to try to keep you in John a little bit. But I can't say that we will stay there the whole time. There's a couple of scriptures that I want you to see here, but we're going to go John 6, verse 41. Starting at John 6, verse 41. John 6 and 41. The Jews then complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. I'm the bread which came down from heaven. Now, if you remember back in the Old Testament, when the people were hungry, God sent them manna, which was a bread that he sent from heaven. Every morning they woke up and went out and it was the, the fields were full of it. All they had to do is go out and pick it up and eat it. He told them, don't keep any of it because it's going to spoil. It's not going to last overnight. But tomorrow I'll resupply it. Tomorrow it'll be there again. Tomorrow you'll have everything that you need to sustain you. Jesus is not manna. Jesus is not manna. But Jesus is the bread that came down from heaven. 42. And they said, is not this Jesus the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then? He says, I have come down from heaven. 43. Jesus therefore answered and said to them, Do not murmur about your, among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. You see that? So you have to be called. God has to call you for you to come to Christ. God has to call you for you to be saved. God has to call you for you to be a Christian. God has to call you for you to understand the Gospels. God has to call you. Well, how does God call you? Did not at some point in time, did you hear a small, still voice inside of you say, hey, get up, go to church, you lazy bum? Well, he may not have told you that, but. Seek me out. Have you heard that? Look for me. Have you heard that? Hey, there's something missing in your life. Guess what? It's me, Jesus. Have you heard that? 
That's Jesus calling you. That's God calling you. There's something missing in my life and I just can't figure it out. That's God calling you. My life is horrible. My life is miserable. I cannot find an inner peace, a happiness in my life. God says, hello. I'm knocking at your door. All you got to do is open. And if you will open it, he promises, I will come in and sup with you. I will come in and be with you forever and ever and ever. That's the small, still voice. And now you may have experienced it another way, but think about it. How did you end up in church? Well, my wife told me I better get here or I ain't going to get no dinner this afternoon. Well, then God used your wife to do that. It wasn't a small, still voice. It was a very demanding, loud voice, probably. But guess what? You're here. And I'm not talking about coming to rock and country church. I'm talking about coming to God. Okay? That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about coming to God. Whether you go to this church or another Bible teaching church or wherever you go, I'm talking about coming to God. You don't have to go to church to be saved. But it's a darn good place to start learning about God. Or it should be anyway. Some of our churches, I'm not so sure. 44, no one can come to the Father unless the Father, or come to me unless the Father has, has sent me. I'm going to start over. <laughs> Verse 44. R erase all that. Edit that out, will you, Chris? No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise them up in the last day. Wow. There's a little bit of a reward there coming from Jesus, is there not? Sure there is. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. They shall all be taught by God. So you see, it's the Holy Spirit that is going to teach you the Word of God. It's not me. I'm just going to share with you what He showed me. It's the Holy Spirit. Only the Holy Spirit can help you understand what I'm trying to say. It is written of the prophets, and they shall be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who, comes, he who is from the Father, he has seen the Father. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. There's your promise right there, John 3.16, remember? Remember? Whosoever believeth in him shall receive eternal life. Paraphrased, of course. And then Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Well, what do you mean? Are you the manna? Are you the manna that came down? No. If you go over to John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1 and 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. This whom we know. So Jesus is the word. The bread that came down from heaven is the word of God. What you hold in your lap is the bread from heaven, which is God's message to us. 48, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they're dead. So it's certainly not manna that's going to keep us alive, right? Right? No, because there's no life in physical bread. You know, you can eat bread all day long. Guess what? You'll get as big as me. Don't do that. It's not a good idea. Okay? Lay off the bread. Lay off the carbs, maybe. But the problem is, is I love them. Okay? But in order to sustain life, we have to eat physical food, right? Right? Now, see, we need to understand here, as Jesus always teaches through his parables, through his stories, he is using something physical that we understand to teach a spiritual doctrine. And that's exactly what he is doing here. He is saying, look, you have to have food for your physical body to, to live, right? Well, guess what? Your spiritual body, which is the true you, which is the real you, it has to have food too. And that food is the word of God. This is the bread which comes down from heaven 
that one may eat of it and not die. It is the word. We must consume, partake, and receive the true word of God in order to have eternal life. 51, he says, I am the living bread. He's not a dead piece of meat or a dead loaf of bread. He is the living, true word of God, which came down from heaven, which he did. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world, which he did when he sacrificed himself on the cross by being obedient to God's command to him to die for you and me. And then he was buried. Then he rose again. Then he walked this earth for about 40 days and then he ascended to the heavens and he sat down at the right hand of God interceding for you and I. Thanks be to God for the bread of heaven. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Oh man, are we talking about cannibalism here? Now these are God's people. Are we going to go out there and chomp on a leg bone or what? Well, he's not talking about eating his literal flesh. He's talking about consuming, receiving, and partaking of his word, partaking of him, himself. It gets even worse if you're not understanding it. Because then Jesus says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat my flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. Oh, wait a minute now. you just gone too far. You're saying we got to eat a leg bone and drink your blood? That ain't right. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's not saying cannibalize me. He's using it as something physical so that we can understand something physical, uh, spiritual. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat my f the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. That doesn't sound right. But if we read on, we'll understand it. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Now, somebody who's not understanding this would assume, yeah, I abide in him because I just ate part of him. But how am I gonna how am I gonna abide in him unless he eats me? I don't wanna do that. Because that's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is, is that you partake and receive my word and understand my word, and you can actually live in Christ and Christ living in you. See, we walk, hopefully, we walk in Christ every day. Hopefully, we walk in the ways and the disciplines. That's what makes a disciple to be a person who follows the disciplines of God, the disciplines of Christ. That's what we're called to do. We're not called to live for ourselves. We're called to live for Jesus. Verse 57. As the living Father sent me, as the living Father sent me. Anybody ever think that, that God's not dead? Remember the song? God's not dead. He's surely alive. Amen. He is. Because the scripture right here just says, the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father. 
He, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate in the manna and are now dead. So it's not a physical thing. He who eats this bread will live forever. Man, that's some good news. Jesus is teaching by that teaching that physical thing or, or a physical thing by a physical thing so that we can understand that he is actually teaching a spiritual lesson here. And we must receive and partake and consume his word, which is him. Then trust and believe that just like the physical food and drink keeps us alive, our bodies alive, the spiritual food and the spiritual drink will also keep our spirit alive. And it will live forever. But we must feed on Christ. We must feed on Christ. Back to John 17. Let's do another verse. John 17. Verse 2. It'll go a little bit quicker now. Because we needed to get that out of the way. We need to get and understand. And actually, if you read uh, John 6, if you go on and read some more, many of his disciples says, man, this is too difficult to understand. And they left. They quit. Just like we have many, many people today who go, oh, oh, I just don't understand all that stuff. It's way beyond my, oh, the book of Revelation? I would never, ever read the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is very simple. I've taught it many times. And I think we're going to teach it again here pretty soon. I don't know. We have some people who want, it, who want it to be taught, so we'll see. But I love the book of Revelation. It is, not, it is not a scary book. It is not a book hard to understand. It is a very simple book. But it is the only book, just to let you know in case you don't know, it is the only book in the Bible that has not come to fruition yet. It's the only book in the Bible that has not happened yet. All 65 of the other books have already happened. And that book will happen. Why? Because the word says it's going to happen. Many of his disciples left him because they could not understand what he was talking about. Why could they not understand? Because they were not attuned to the spirit of Jesus. You see, in order for you to understand in order for you to, to receive his message, you must have the Spirit. You must have God's Holy Spirit living inside of you. Matter of fact, Jesus tells us over in 16, I think we're going to see it in a little bit. He says the, the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. So it's the Holy Spirit that's here to teach you, not me. It's God speaking in your heart right now, that small, still voice in your heart saying, well, I understand that it's not physical food that he's teaching you about. It's spiritual food he's teaching you about. See, that would be the Holy Spirit show, teaching you, not me teaching you. So if you did not understand this passage that we just shared, you might want to check to see if the Holy Spirit exists in your life. I'm not judging anything now, I'm just saying. Because Jesus tells us that the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. All things. Verse 2. As I have given him authority, as you have given him authority, given Jesus authority, God gave Jesus authority over everything, over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him as many as that kind of reiterates the fact that you are called, you and I are called by God to come to Christ. And hopefully you have received Jesus as Lord. If we are called by God, and we are, God entrusts us, entrusts us unto his physical son, Jesus. Jesus was and is a physical man, the example that we are to emulate and imitate. The one true authority over all mankind, over all mankind, even non-believers. It doesn't matter whether you truly believe or not as far as whether he has authority over you. Because you are an, if you are an unbeliever, he still has authority. He is the supreme authority. And he has authority over everything. Why? Because he created everything. 
Then after we are called, we are given to Christ that he, the man Jesus, because he is a physical man, will have a loyal people to rule over. A loyal people to rule over. See, this is where some of the guys go, ah, no, man, I'm my own boss. Ain't nobody going to be my boss. Hey, I've heard some women say that too, let me tell you. Ain't no man going to be my boss. And then the guy comes back and says, oh, you remember over there where in Ephesians where it says, submit unto me, woman. Well, you better read Ephesians 4 and 21 where it says, submit to one another, submit to one another as unto Christ. It don't say anywhere, guys, that we the boss. Ask your wife. She'll tell you. She'll tell you. But guess what? God needed and God wants a people to rule over, a loyal people. That would be his church. And guess what? Someday, someday, in Revelation 20 verse 4, we will rule with him. We will rule with him. Now, I don't mean that whenever you, you know, whenever 20, Revelation 24 comes along, if you will, that doesn't mean that you're going to be the boss. Because Jesus is always going to be the boss. Whether you like it or not, he's the boss. And nobody can take his place. But what he is going to do is, is he is going to give us, quote unquote, power and authority to reign over people in order to not be their boss, but to help them understand who Jesus is. The same exact thing that you're called to do right now. Wow, is that an eye opener or what? There's nothing new under the sun according to Solomon, okay? What you're gonna do in heaven is what you're called to do right now. So why not get in the practice now? Get into practice now. Start working on it. Don't you know if whenever you get up there to heaven, don't you want to hear Jesus is going to say, hey, well done, great and faithful servant. Those who have, who, have, uh, uh, who have produced much, much more will be given. Wait a minute. That means they got to work a whole lot more. But you see, we don't get tired in heaven. God's never tired. Jesus is never tired. They never stop working. They work 24-7, 365. We will never get tired. And guess what? If we get thirsty, water will be right there. If we get hungry, food will be right there. Jesus, I'm hungry. He has always supplied plenty of food for me. Don't say anything. You don't have to agree. But he provides everything that I need all the time. I, I told you last week, I think it was last week, maybe the week before. Anything this church has ever needed has been supplied. Bam, right away. Anytime we had a question about something, we pray. We pray. Hey, guess what? We do at this church. We pray. And God answers our prayers. And he provides everything we have ever needed on time, perfect timing. Talk about perfect timing. When our, our uh, um, we call them things out there. Thank you. Septic system. It collapsed. It went pfft. And we had no basically septic system. Now, you think that wouldn't be a mess? Pardon the pun. Thank you. And immediately I called up the septic company and they said, oh, yeah, we'll be right out and fix it. And they fixed it. Never missed a beat. Now, they didn't fix it like fixing that one. They replaced it, which it needed to be replaced. It was an old fiberglass system. Anyway, it needed to be replaced. Now we got a system they ain't never going to break. And unless God changes this whole entire world, we'll, we'll have a good system from now on. My point is, is that anything and everything we've ever needed, God has provided exactly when we needed it. It's been there. I told you about the children's furniture last, I think it was last week, week before. Last week. last week, yeah. We needed some, we prayed about it that day. A lady called me that night and says, I got kids' furniture. You want some? You need some? Come pick it up. That's how God works. You call in the name of the Lord and he stops and he listens. And he takes care of his children. He takes care of his children. Trust me, he does. Verse 3. 
And this is eternal life. You ever wonder what eternal life is? I mean, you ever really want, oh yeah, I know what it is. It means I'm going to live forever and ever and ever. It's really far more than that. I want to share with you what eternal life is. And actually, we're going to see it right here in our scripture. And this is eternal life, that they may know you. They may know you. The only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Do you know God or do you know of God? Big difference there. Big difference. Do you know God or do you know of God? Most Christians, I'm sorry to say, know of God. Oh, yeah, I went to church. I got baptized, so I'm a Christian now. And I don't know exactly what all they do there. I went a couple of times, and it was pretty fun. We had a good time. That's not why you're in church. You're in church, especially this church, I can say. You're in this church to know God and Jesus Christ. That's why you're here. You're here to know him. So what does it mean to know God? So what is eternal life? Everyone saved and unsaved will live forever. Everyone saved and everyone unsaved will live forever. Your soul and your spirit never die. Your soul and your spirit never dies. Your body's going to die at some point in time. But your soul and your spirit, which is the true you, is never going to die. But the problem is, is you're going to be in one of two places. You're either going to be in heaven or you're going to be in hell. You're either going to be in heaven or you're going to be in hell. There's no purgatory. There's no middle of the road. There's no, uh, well, you know, God's going to still let me into heaven because I'm really a good guy. I'm just going to be mucking stalls, you know, uh, carrying out all the horse stuff and cleaning stalls for him. No, no, no. You're either going to be in heaven in the presence of God or you're not. That's it. Well, I don't want to go to hell. Well, then you better know God. Well, I heard hell's a pretty bad place. It is. And not only that, it is eternal. It is eternal. Just like heaven is eternal, hell is eternal. Jesus spoke more in the scriptures on hell than he did in heaven, about heaven. Why? Because he doesn't want you to go there. He doesn't want you to be there. Jesus experienced the true hell, if you will, and the true death for each and every one of us. And we're going to see that in just a little bit. In Matthew 10, go to Matthew 10. Oh, jeez. Y'all not limited on time today, are you? Thank you. Well, that, that's one. I need two to confirm. All right. Thank you. All right, we're good to go. 2 and 28, real short verse. And do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. So in other words, the soul does not die. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both body, soul and body in hell. The body in hell, that means you're going to have a body in hell. Your, your soul, your spirit is going to have a body in hell. Those who are unbelievers. That means you're going to feel all the pain and the agony. Remember where it says the weeping and gnashing of teeth? That's what they're referring to as hell. It's going to be a horrible, horrible place. Now, I know, you, I, know I told you to go to Matthew 10 and you're finally there, but now let's go to Romans 2. You, ha you got to catch up to me. Catch up to me. Romans 2. It was just one scripture. But it was very important that you see that scripture. Because the, Jesus said, that was Jesus speaking. He says, beware, there is one that, that cannot kill your soul, but yet it will be in, he in hell, the soul and the body. And it can't, your soul cannot die, your spirit cannot die. And you will have a body to suffer eternity in hell. That's not good. 
Romans 2, starting at verse 5. Romans 2, starting at verse 5. But in, cor in accordance with the hardness of your impenitent, which means non-repentant, which means you will not repent from whatever it is, your non-repentant heart, I'll put it that way, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath for the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Verse 6, who will render to each one according to their deeds, to his deeds? Eternal life to those who by patient con uh, con continence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immort immortality. But those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish on every soul, on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jews first and also of the Greek. In other words, everybody, every soul is going to pay for what they have done, both good and evil. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jews first and then to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. In other words, he is not going to say, well, William, you're such a good, good Christian. You know, even though you're not saved and you think you're a Christian, I'm, I, you know, I'm just going to let you in because you're just such a great guy. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Well, all you unbelievers, now that you see because the church is gone after the rapture, the church is out of here, and you sit there and you go, oh my gosh, they were not lying. It's true. It really happened. So all you unbelievers who now believe, just come on, come on, you come on up too. There's no second rapture. There's not a second rapture. There's only one. And that's when God takes his church out of this earth, out of this world. And that church, which is believers, it's not rock and country church. It is the believers in rock and country church. All right. Then God takes the church out of this world. All those who believe. And then everybody's going to go, oh, man, they were right. I can't believe that. It really happened. Well, I'm going to believe now. Well, guess what? You still got to go through the tribulation period. Now, you can be saved after the rapture. But you're going to have to go through the tribulation period. And lo and behold, if you read through the, through the uh, book of Revelation, a third, let's say that the world's population is 9 billion people. A third, which is 3 billion people, are going to be wiped out almost immediately by war, famine, pestilence, all kinds of horrible, horrible, horrible things are going to happen to the people of the world who are left behind. See, that's why as Christians, we don't want anybody to be left behind. We want to encourage them. Now, they have to make the choice, but you have to encourage them to seek God in order to not go through the tribulation period. Because, again, the tribulation period has not happened yet. But Jesus says it's going to happen. God says it's going to happen. The Holy Spirit says it's going to happen. God's Word says it's going to happen. So guess what? I think it's going to happen. After all, 65 books have been right so far. Why wouldn't one more? It will. It will. It will. It will. It will. It will. Our soul and spirit will live either in hell or in heaven. We will be gathered into the presence of God forever if you are a believer. And this is eternal life, to be gathered into the presence of God forever and ever and ever and to know him. When Chris and Lori first came to this church, they were just Chris and Lori. I didn't know who they were. I didn't know their last name. You got a five-year-old grandson. What are you doing with a five-year-old grandson? Not that it's my business. I'm not going there. But my point is, is that now I know Chris and Lori. I have a relationship with Chris and Lori. A greater relationship than I had the day they walked in here. 
And I know who they are. And I know maybe more about them than I want to know. They certainly probably know more about me than they want to know. But my point is, is that as you go through time with people, if you will, you come to know them more and more and more and more. It's the same thing with God. The more you're in his presence, the more you will know him. The more you will seek him, the more you will want to be with him. The longer you stay with him. And the great part about it is, is that when we die, we get to be with him. And if you're a believer, you will be with him for eternity. We speak of having a relationship with an invisible God. Oh, yes, I know God. He's my, he's my friend. Well, what does he look like? Well, uh, whatever Jesus looks like. Well, what does Jesus look like? Uh, whatever he looks like. I don't know. I've never seen him personally. But guess what? Someday, someday we shall. We worship an invisible God that is alive because we believe it. Why? Because the scriptures tells us that he is alive. We just saw it a little bit ago. We also saw that Jesus lives. And so we worship Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Why? Have we seen him? No, but we know he's alive. Why? Because scripture tells us he's alive and we believe in scripture. But someday, but someday, as Scripture tells us, we shall see him as he is. 1 John 3, 2. We shall see him as he is. 1 John 3, 2. And we shall also see him face to face, as Scripture tells us. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. We shall see Jesus face to face. Oh. As I am standing, Bubba, stand up, Bubba. As I am standing here face to face to Bubba, I will stand face to face to Jesus. And so will you. You will see him face to face. Not from a distance. Not from a throne way up there. Not behind millions and millions and millions of people. You will see him face to face. Thank you, brother. You will see him face to face. Man, what a glorious day that shall be. To see Jesus face to face. Now I'm ready to see Jesus. And I want to see David. Because I'm going to say David what the heck were you thinking? I'm going to see Moses. And I'm going to say Moses why would you hit the rock twice? He didn't you even hit the rock. Don't hit the rock. He didn't say hit the rock. But yeah you hit it twice. Why would you do that? Do you know Moses didn't go into the, into the promised land? You know why he didn't go in? Because he was disobedient. He hit the rock. Don't hit the rock. It's, it's that simple. Whatever God tells you to do, that's what you do. If he says don't hit the rock, then guess what? Don't hit the rock. How difficult is that? We will see Jesus face to face. We will truly come. This is eternal life. We will spend eternity knowing him more and more and more, being in his presence and seeing him face to face. How awesome would that be? Do you know that when you see him face to face, this is what he's going to do whenever you start approaching. He's going to reach out his hands. When he reaches out his hands, guess what? You're going to see the scars. You're going to see the marks. You're going to see the scars on his head. You're going to see the scar on his side. You're going to see the scars on his hands and his feet. Even if he wears sandals, you'll still see the scars. That's what man gave our Savior. But what does God give you? Eternal life. Eternal life. And his arms are going to be extended, welcoming you into his presence. You know that when you pass, when you die, God sends an army of angels to carry you into the presence of the Lord. Wow. That's awesome. 
And I look forward to the day. And that day's going to come. It could be today, it could be tomorrow, it could be 10 years from now. I don't know when it's coming, but it will come. Why? Because the Word says it's going to happen. It is appointed to want, for once, for man to die once. So everybody, everybody is going to die one time. Unless Christ comes back first. Everybody. So guess what? You're not, I'm going to live to be 120. All right? I, I believe it. I'm going to live to be 120. After I, uh, Terry tells me all the things that her dad's going through, I'm not sure I want to, but actually I do. Why? Because God has given me the best life I could possibly imagine. Far beyond my expectations. And I'm so thankful. So very, very thankful. Verse 4. I have glorified you on earth, and I have finished the work that you have given me to do. Jesus says, I have glorified you, talking to the Father. On earth, I have finished the work which you have given me to do. Jesus tells us over in John 6, 38 through 40. I'm going to go there. You can go there if you want to. John 6. We were there a while ago. But we're going to look at verse 38 through 40. Verse 38 through 40. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. This is, you might want to highlight this and underline this. This is the will of the Father who sent me. I've had so many people tell me, well, I don't know what the will of God is. I just don't know what God wants me to do. I just have no idea what God has in store for me. Read verses 30, John 6, verses 38 through 40. Verse 39, this is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up in the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise them up in the last day. That's the will of God for you. For actually, for everyone, is that God will bring you unto Christ, you will know who Christ is, and you will believe in him, and he will raise you up in the last day to spend eternity with him. That's what God wants you to do. He, understand this now, God wants Woody, and I don't know why, but he wants Woody to be with him. I can't get my wife to want me to be with her sometimes. But God wants me to be with him for eternity. And God wants you to be with him for eternity. That is his will. That's what he wants. He doesn't want anyone, anyone to be lost. Not one. On the cross, Jesus proclaimed, it is finished, John 19 and 30. It is finished. The work Jesus was sent to do is finished. Our work to glorify God, Jesus came to, to do his work to glorify God, the work that the Father sent him to do. He did it. He said it's finished on the cross. He says, my work is finished. Now it is our turn, our turn to glorify God by continuing the work that Christ started. Just as Christ came to his 12 disciples or his 11 disciples and taught them from chapter 13 to chapter 17, the night before he was to die, and he taught them about everything that was, everything that is, and everything that's going to be, he, he helped them learn, and he says, go out, Matthew 28, 19, uh, 18 through 22, go out into all the nations, teaching, making disciples, and baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That is your job. That is my job, to do exactly what Jesus came to do, make disciples and getting them to believe that God loves them. That's your job. You want to know the will of God? That's the second will of God. The first one is, is that you be saved. The second one is, is that you continue the work of Jesus Christ. Jesus says those who... Do my work, love me. Wow. So that must mean those who do not do his work doesn't love him. That's Jesus. I'm not passing judgment. Verse 5 of John 17. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself. 
with the glory which I had with you before the world was. With the glory that I had with you before the world was. Profound statement. Oh yeah, I know who Jesus is. He was that baby born in a manger. Uh, actually, he wasn't born in a manger. He was laid in a manger. He was born in a stable. A manger is a feed trough. Jesus was a baby when he became, when God became a man, Emmanuel, God with us. He was born in Bethlehem by a virgin. We know the virgin birth. If you don't know it, stick around till Christmas. We'll tell the Christmas story, then you'll know it. But Jesus existed before anything else was. If you read over in 1 John in 3, it says everything that was made was made by him and for him. Everything that was made, all the stars, all the heavens, all the planets, all the earth, all the, the uh, uh, dogs and cats and horses and rats and all that stuff, everything was made for him and by him. And nothing that was made was not made by him. Everything was made by him. So Jesus existed before anything else was. Jesus became... Uh, uh, the son of God as we know him, and he referred to himself as son of man uh, whenever he was born in a stable, laid in a manger. Then he became what we call, the, and he called the son of man because he wanted us to know that he was just like a man, just like me and you. He felt everything. He got tired. He got hungry. He got, he, uh, he got fed up with a couple of people. Remember one time he even told Peter, he said, get thee behind me, Satan. But most of all, he loved people. And we're supposed to do the exact same thing. That's why we have this book. That's why we pray over this book. That's why we, we love each other, because Christ loves you. And so therefore, we love you. We may not know you, but we still love you because God loves you. Because that's what we're called to do. Once again, by returning... To his righteous throne, which he did, God raised him up in the last day. God raised him up in the last day. And Jesus ascended and sat down at the right hand of the Father, Romans 8, and is interceding for you and I. So God has glorified Jesus by allowing him to die for you and me to pay a way that we could have eternity with them. He rose, he resurrected him, brought him back to life because the man, Jesus, literally died. He walked the earth for 40 days. Acts 1. And then he ascended into heaven, Acts 1. And he is, he is seated next to the Father on his heavenly throne, interceding for you and I, Romans 8. God glorified him by giving him the glory that he had, which is in God's presence. The same glory he had before anything else was, he gave it back to him. He gave it back to him. Jesus was no longer a man. He will never die. He is eternal, just as God is eternal. He died once for all people, for everyone, and he shall never have to sacrifice himself again. Because the debt to God has been paid. And he paid it. And he is the only one that could pay it. The unblemished Lamb of God. And someday, but for only those who believe, God will glorify you. God will glorify you. How? By putting you in his presence. The sinful people that we are, and every one of us are sinful people. We've all sinned, fallen short of the glory of God, according to Romans uh, 3. Paul tells us that. No, not one is righteous. But God is going to glorify you and me by allowing us in his presence face to face. Face to face. Can you imagine touching Jesus' nose? I mean, that, just, uh, that would just thrill me. Just, it would thrill me to touch his garment. It would thrill me to tie the sandals, all right? 
like John said. I'm unworthy to tie, untie the sandals of Christ. It would thrill me to see him face to face. But we're going to be able to hug him. We're going to be able to kiss him. We're going to be able to bow at his feet and praise him and worship him for the glory he's going to give us someday. Someday. So, do our prayers follow Jesus' prayer? Do we long for God to show himself to us? Today, so that we may bring glory to him? You see, do we, do we seek out God for our own glory, for our own fame, for our own fortune, for our own recognition? Or do we seek out God so that we, God so that we may love him? See, that's, that's what we're to do. We're to express our love, an attitude of gratitude, express our love to God who is Christ, who is the Holy Spirit because of what he has done for us. Jesus paved the way that you and I can stand and sit and bow at the feet of God. Wow. And see him face to face. And someday, someday, as he glorified Jesus, someday, if you are a believer, a true believer, he will glorify you. Can you imagine? Just, I love that song, I can only imagine. Can you imagine being in the presence of Jesus? And saying, Jesus, I don't know how to say thank you. Other than the fact is just simply saying and meaning it in my heart. Thank you. But see, that's all God wants from you. He doesn't want your money. He doesn't want your time. He doesn't want your expertise. He doesn't want your, your, uh, your famous face. What he wants is, is you to love him. And then we give him everything else because we love him. That's the reason we come to church, to worship and praise and glorify God with our love. We don't come to church to be seen or to see. We don't come to church just to pay tithes, just to sing songs, just to feel good. As a matter of fact, and, and people don't understand this, you should not feel good when you leave church. You should not feel good when you leave church. You should feel convicted that you're not doing enough to thank him for what he has done for you. Okay? Now, I'm not saying go out here with gloom and doom. Oh, I'm such a dirt bag. That's not what I'm saying. You go out here with your head high. You go out here being proud. You go out here being completely just engulfed in the love of God, knowing that you have been chosen to be a child of the Most High God. That's why you go out of this room. I am unworthy. God makes me worthy. God does not qualify the, uh, call the qualified because there ain't a one of us that's qualified. But he qualifies the called. So when you leave these walls, I hope that you will go out shouting to the heavens, thank God I am saved. Amen. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you, Lord, for each and every day. I thank you, Lord, for Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for Jesus praying for me. I thank you, Lord, that he loved me so much that he came and died for me. I thank you, Lord, that he came and died for each and every person on this earth, that they, would, that they would humble themselves to the point to where they would realize just the debt that he has paid, and it has been paid. And from this point on, all God wants from us is our love for him. And how do we express that love for him? By showing the Jesus that lives in us to all those who will receive it. It's just that simple. 
But you can't do that. You can't truly do that unless you have Jesus. I know it sounds kind of cliche, if you will, but it's the truth. That's what the Word says. We just read over in John 6 and 40, the will of God is that all who look upon Jesus shall believe, shall believe, shall believe, and thus be saved. If that's you today and you have not looked upon Jesus to receive your salvation, I pray that you will humble yourself, surrender your heart, surrender your will to our Most High God and receive Him today as Lord and Savior. You do that real simply by praying. There it is. There's that word again. Praying. Just say, dear Jesus, but mean it in your heart. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I ask you to be my Lord and my Savior. I am prepared and ready and willing to follow you from this day forward as a child of the Most High God. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you.